Welcome to AFSPA Talks, a production of the American Foreign Service Protective Association with Chief Operating Officer Kyle Longton. Be sure to subscribe to us on your favorite podcast channel. Enjoy the episode. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of AFSPA Talks. Um, I'm Kyle Longton, and here with me is... Anna Wolfhart. And today we're going to talk about some... uh, additional ways that you can find support for your mental wellness needs. And in particular, we're going to look at chronic conditions and major events that you might experience and for which you might need support. Um, Something like the loss of a loved one, a change in your family structure. um, And like I said, a diagnosis, maybe a new diagnosis for yourself or a loved one. Hannah, have you ever run into this in your own life, either for yourself or, or maybe a loved one? Yeah, definitely. I think going through the loss of a loved one is always a tough uh, path to navigate. And I experienced that when I lost my grandfather some time ago now, but still it's, it's hard to deal with. And so any resources that can help are always, you know, welcome. And I think that's a hard part for people is trying to find help. They don't know exactly where to go always. So and the fact that we have these resources and we're talking about it, I think it's great. Yeah. And, and, and in a situation like you described with, a, you know, dealing with the loss of a loved one, a lot of times we're focused on that loved one's well-being or trying to take care of those around us and, and neglect the care for ourselves. Um, I, I also lost a grandparent um, about five years ago, just a couple months after my first kids were born. And so I had this huge life change, something that, that is supposed to be full of joy, but also comes with a lot of stress. And then the loss of, of somebody I was really close with, my grandmother, um, within about two months. And it was, it was very difficult. I know I ran into troubles, um, coping during that time. And so, um, I'm glad that I'd had, I had some, some good people around me and some access to resources, but, um, I didn't quite know where to turn. And so I agree with you, you know, what, what resources we have. So we talked about one of those resources, um, on our very first episode with Dr. Julia Hoffman, Um, And that was my strength. And we touched on some of the other programs that are out there. But our focus today is on um, a couple ways that that the Foreign Service Benefit Plan can support members, um, specifically ABLE2. And I want to mention, we're going to talk about ABLE2, but I do want to mention that it is available only for stateside members, those who are physically in the United States. But the other program we're going to talk about is the care management that's available through Um, the FSBP's clinical team um, and the care management specifically for behavioral health needs um, exists. We've got a dedicated team and it's available to all members. So Hannah, we're we're talking about this as a program able to, and the clinical clinical health support as part of a program available to FSBP members. But um, everybody who's listening to this, I hope, um, or, or much wider group are eligible for membership. And so members can learn about these programs and, at a qualifying life event or during open season, take the opportunity, become a, an FSBP member, either come back to the fold or join us for the first time and take advantage of these programs. Hun, I have to be honest, I've, I've been working at ASPA for a little bit longer than you have. It's it's eight years for me in April and it and you've been here not quite eight months or are we, are we at that point? Yeah, I think we're at the eight months point. Okay. So um, I, I, I know, feel like I know a lot of our programs really well, but, and, and I understand the care management side, but I don't know that much about ABLE2. Um, and so we, we are bringing on today's guest to talk about it. And our guest today um, will be, is somebody I just met recently um, alongside you and um, somebody who's going to be new for our members, but this is Dr. William Gillis, um, Bill Gillis, and he is a senior clinical director with CVS Aetna. He has more than uh, two decades of experience as a licensed clinical psychologist. Um, Initially in his early years, he was providing direct clinical service and running large clinics, but he then moved into some leadership roles, first with Magellan and then at Aetna. Um, He took his experience in behavioral health, innovation strategy, and behavioral integration with complex internal and external partners, program design, subject matter expert, customer service, and support clinical operations, quality management, and cost and trend analysis support. And he's using that to support a number of um, different plans and a number of different needs within CVS Aetna. 
right now, he does that um, as part of an innovation and strategy leadership team that's responsible for developing and getting innovative behavioral health solutions across um, CVS Aetna. So he's working with groups like us who have our, our plans, um, the Foreign Service Benefit Plan, to provide insight on key trend drivers, educate on current benefit offerings like he's doing today, and strategize how to optimize current and emerging capabilities. So I am looking forward to this um, talk because I know just from, from a brief conversation we had with him recently that I'm going to learn something. I hope you are too, and I hope our listeners are as well. Definitely. Sounds good. So without any further ado, Dr. Bill Gillis, welcome to AFSPA Talks. We're talking about behavioral health. Um, It's a broad term. And what do we mean when we use it? So it is confusing out there. Um, You know, you hear behavioral health, mental health, uh, mental well-being. There's a lot of different terms. Uh, But that's an overall umbrella term. And when you think about it, behavioral health will encompass um, the whole spectrum of our mental well-being. And that's everything from you know, just experiencing stress to uh, actually, you know, feeling depressed or, or anxious, but it also gets into uh, kind of the overall territory of, you know, you know, you know, struggling with substance, you know, substance use or, or alcohol use issues. So it's pretty broad underneath that umbrella. Typically, when we think of it in kind of the professional world, we carve it out between those two camps. Mental health is really the emotional um, part of your life. And then the substance alcohol use is the other side. And okay. You know, they do mix up once in a while, too. Yeah. 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 And I want to come back to each of those um, in in just a moment. But um, you are a psychologist um, and and a lot of people think uh, here, mental health, here, behavioral health. And we think immediately of psychologists, sometimes psychiatrists. um, But there's a, a range of other professionals who practice in the behavioral health arena. Can you just provide our listeners a, a an overview of those professionals and maybe sort of their scope of practice? Yeah, and I think you know, when we think about it, I always actually find it pretty surprising in terms of how far reaching the um, behavioral health profession gets into so many aspects of not only our lives, but you know, also just professionally kind of where they go. But I'll try to limit it to um, kind of what we typically think of when we, we need our own, you know, we, we, want, you know, we want help um, at different levels of care. So first of all, when you think about, um, I want to see a counselor or I want to, I want to go to therapy, uh, you, have all, you have a lot of different choices of people that have different licensure levels to get help with just um, counseling. Uh, so you have, uh, you, you know, basically kind of who I am, I'm a clinical psychologist, and there's a lot of other different kinds of psychologists out there, but clinical psychologists are those that uh, you know, provide, you know, therapy, uh, they've been trained kind of, you know, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot of years, but also what differentiates a psychologist than say like a, a like a licensed clinical social worker or a licensed pro- um, professional counselor, or you've probably heard of masters, I mean, a uh, marriage and family therapist. What differentiates us is we offer not only therapy, but we're also uh, very good in terms of doing different types of assessments. And so we're trained and skilled on doing assessments. And, uh, and also, we also tend to, just because of our schooling, have been required to um, go pretty deep in terms of research. Uh, and so that's, that's really kind of a differentiator psychologist. But at the end of the day, you want someone that is trained to help you in, with good therapy. And so psychologists, uh, master's level therapists, uh, really no difference. It's really your kind of training and skill level and, and ability to be with that person, that patient in the room and, to, and take care of them in, in a way that's effective. Okay. And, and it's about finding the, the right fit for your needs, but also making sure that it's somebody you can be open and, and share with in that, that confidential environment. And, and that piece right there is because I'm I'm a consumer, uh, and at times in my life, uh, I've definitely appreciated um, going to therapy and counseling. I think that's important for all of us, and we'll get into this in terms of impact of COVID. But even prior to that, I think it's very healthy for us to recognize, hey, we're emotional beings, and it's you know we're we're not trained to really always figure out what's happening in terms of how we're thinking and feeling and how it affects our behavior. So let's go to someone that can help. Now, 
it's a mystery sometimes out there for us as consumers when we have to make that choice. And that's where we're trying to get better at helping people understand, well, who's actually doing therapy that is correct, um, that is effective, because there's not a lot of transparency around that. Uh, you know, a lot of times we go by word of mouth, uh, we'll go on Google, you know, we'll go kind of do searches. Um, but at the end of the day, you want as a consumer to be assured about two things. One, it, like you said, Kyle, it's a good fit. You feel comfortable with this person because you're going to be opening up about things that are highly personal, highly sensitive. But you also want to know that this person has good experience. Uh, they um, uh, are showing that they abide by certain, you know, there's certain types of therapy that are proven to be effective. And you want to make sure that that person is uh, implementing and, and using therapy models that are those that have been based on research that are proven to be helpful to you. Excellent. Excellent. And, and we've seen a, a huge increase in behavioral health needs and, and utilization over the last year. Um, people turning to, to support for stress, anxiety, depression, isolation, loss, and, and other forms of trauma. Bill, based on your experience, and, and you've got access to a lot of data, um, you know, what trends are you seeing in terms of the diagnoses, why, why people are seeking treatment? So pr even prior to COVID, we've been seeing um, what we consider is, I mean, we were already calling prior to COVID uh, what we're seeing in, in the behavioral health world, both with the mental health and, and substance use, uh, different issues rising up to epidemic levels uh, within our country and, and more broadly uh, within our world. And so let me kind of first talk about that. And I don't want to be really down on this, but it's important for us to recognize even prior to COVID, we were in a place of uh, struggling. And so we, we saw uh, suicide rates uh, continually to increase. Uh, it very problematic. And in, 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 in so that um, was hitting uh, especially young adults and older adults. Um, suicide rates um, were very concerning to us. Uh, we also saw that isolation was already becoming a factor uh, prior to COVID, especially around teens. Uh, and there's a lot of isolation. And, and then depression uh, has continued to increase. Autism uh, continues to increase. And it's not that we're just getting better at you know, identifying. There's something happening out there where incrementally, almost every year, the, you know, the, the number of, of, of you know, unfortunately, children, people with autism increases uh, in, the, in the general population. So those are things we're looking out for on the, on the mental health side. But then on the substance use side, of course, we've all been aware of the opiate, um, opiate epidemic, and that has not abated, and it continues to increase. And when we talk about then what, we, what we're seeing in COVID, it it's, has not, not gone away. But there are hidden uh, issues um, in terms of substance abuse that we don't see as a health plan until someone walks in the door for uh, like detox or, you know, going to the hospital for rehab. And so, so substance abuse, uh, you know, especially around alcohol is a hidden, a very serious hidden issue. It has a lot of impact on all of us. And so that's, that's a concerning thing. And we have seen the, the, the utilization of people ending up in the hospital for alcohol related conditions increasing as well. So that was pre um, COVID. So what we saw with COVID starting March of 2020, um, we were all pretty freaked out um, and, and we probably continue to be so and, and, and very stressed, but very concerned about what is this and how do I protect myself? All of us then just went into our, our, our shells and most of us did. And what that meant is we wanted to avoid places where we potentially can get exposed to COVID. So large group settings, indoors. And so people that were probably um, appropriate to end up in like a hospital level of care, you know, be it for, you know, struggling with um, you know, really serious depression or a bipolar issue that, that is really needing, you know, to be spent time into a safe, um, you know, safe facility or substance use, those people, if they could avoid it, they did not go to the hospital. And so we saw a drop, a huge drop in people ending up in psychiatric, you know, in, in you know, mental health facilities or substance use facilities in that March period uh, down into 
um, and through the beginning of the summer. So big drop. Uh, it Then it kind of came up in the summer a little bit. And then with the second wave of COVID, again, it dropped. And now we're beginning to see people uh, feeling a little more comfortable with the, the safety protocols of the hospitals to if they they need to and they they'll, they'll, they're going but on the flip side of this um, outpatient which was really interesting we saw that people that were already existing I mean already in treatment with their outpatient provider be it you know a psychiatrist or, or a therapist face to face they all just pivoted and they kept their appointments and stayed engaged with their therapists or psychiatrists via telemedicine, which was great. I mean, that was, we are, we've been slowly adopting the idea of telemedicine, um, but we are still, in my opinion, kind of almost at zero in the use of telemedicine prior to all this. And it just exploded. And we are probably five to 10 years further along in terms of adoption of telemedicine than we would have been um, it, you know, without COVID. So that's kind of a silver lining. And I hate to say that, but that, that actually is, is got us to a place that it improves access for us now with us feeling more comfortable with, the, with telemedicine. Uh, we also saw something that intuitively makes sense is that um, people, once they got, you know, to see their therapist via telemedicine, their psychiatrist, they kept their appointments. Um, you know, the, the no-show rates just dropped. Uh, and if you were like me as a, as a therapist way back when, uh, sometimes I counted on those no-show rates because <laughs> I needed a break. Uh, but now um, our, our therapists and psychiatrists are really almost at capacity. And so we'll have to look for other options, non-standard options for folks to gain access to mental health counseling and, and psychiatry. And we'll talk about that later on. I know you'll, you'll have some questions around that. Yeah. And, and I just, I want to stay with telemedicine for a minute because you, you said we're about five or 10 years further along than we would have been had it not been for the, the pandemic and just FSBP alone saw a 2000%, more than a 2000% increase last year in the number of members using telemedicine compared to 2019 and about half of the, yeah. And one half of those using telemedicine were, were using it for behavioral health. Um, half of the, the claims we paid last year for, for that were for behavioral health because people were keeping their appointments. And, and it seems like people, you mentioned this, this makes care more accessible. It seems like people maybe are more comfortable doing this in, in their own environment. Um, but uh, is there evidence that the virtual care is effective? We see people are, are keeping their appointments. Is the care as effective as it might have been in person? So the, so I'll flip that question a little bit and then I'll answer it actually. So sorry, that's kind of roundabout. That's why um, we have a psychologist on. Go for it. <laughs> so we, um, so the, the question is, was your care effective face-to-face -face prior to going, you know, to, to switching to telemedicine? And the, the question is variable out there. And that's something that's important for us and that we're working on is how to, we, how do we help you as that consumer member that's going to buy this service uh, to make sure you're getting to a provider that is on top of his or her game. So that's, so that's work we're needing to do. And we'll talk about some of those things that we're, we're doing um, to help with that. But basically, you know, um, telemedicine um, would, is only as effective as your provider is. So if you had a provider that's effective and, and, and using good evidence-based practice, it's going to be a, pretty much effective. Of course, in doing therapy or, or uh, seeing your psychiatrist via Zoom or whatever your platform is, is not as good as actually being physically in the room, um, but it's, it's really almost good enough for most, most, distort, you know, most, most conditions. And, and so I think the message that I wanna say is, go for it uh, because it's you're not going to you're going to lose a lot more by not going than um, by you know taking advantage of the telemedicine there there are certain um, there are certain uh, uh, conditions behavioral health conditions that really aren't appropriate if you can avoid it uh, I mean those are the folks who really are struggling with you know really complex um, kind of high risk conditions uh, that need um, to have more of a team approach, and it's harder to 
um, have that team approach when it's just one person in Zoom. Um, so, you know, those are the types of conditions we're concerned about. We are seeing for organizations that are hospital based, um, you know, person doesn't need to be hospitalized, but they need to be part of a team. They're actually creating that virtual environment around them. Um, so that's some of the things that are new that are coming out for those folks. That's great. There's, there's a lot of innovation coming and, and a lot of increased utilization of tools that were there before. And, and I want to take a few minutes and talk about one of those, those tools in a, a specific mode of virtual care that's available to Foreign Service Benefit Plan members, and that's able to. Um, so I'll refer members to their plan brochure for the full description. Um, but I think this, this is a program that's largely unknown and certainly underutilized. Um, Bill, can you give us a, a brief overview of the able to program? Yes, and I actually have been along um, with th their journey uh, since we since able to start it. <laughs> so they've been a, actually a partner for us for 12 years. And so when you think about 12 years ago, uh, what we were trying to figure out for our members was we knew that, uh, first of all, we want to improve access and telemedicine really wasn't a a thing that we all talked about much, but we knew that telemedicine was emerging and, and we wanted to make sure that we were partnering with good uh, behavioral health provider groups that were just very good and very effective. So uh, that's one of the things that was important for us. The second one is that we um, wanted to partner with a, you know, a, a group that was gonna provide effective treatment, but also time limited. So you, you weren't going to be in therapy for years. They're going to just help you within an eight week time frame and really help you with, uh, you know, trying to figure out, well, why am I feeling and experiencing what I'm feeling and how, you know, why am I reacting these ways and how, how are my thoughts impacting, you know, my, my overall health and, and, and who I am. So we uh, also wanted that time limited aspect. Uh, so we have access, we have a time limited, but also that proven effective you know, pr you know, provider. And then the last thing, when we started this with them, we were very concerned with, for people that um, had both struggles with some kind of medical uh, concern, uh, chronic medical condition. So think about that person that's struggling with maybe um, some form of heart disease or diabetes um, or, or cancer. Um, so they're very good at helping people that have those, you know, those struggles. But on top of that, they're also struggling with some kind of a emotional um, uh, uh, concern there. So think about that person that is dealing with depression or anxiety or um, maybe even social anxiety, panic. When you have a person that's already dealing with a medical issue and on top of that, you put depression life is going to be so much harder for that person. And we know the course of the treatment for the medical is just going to be much more of a struggle. Uh, and so we want to make sure we find, you know, we were, if we're able to, they just checked off those boxes for us because they are very good at helping, um, uh, you know, that type of, you know, population group for us. Excellent. So, it, so it's like, you know, trying to address, the whole person, various needs that somebody may be, yeah. may be facing, but in a time limited way, like you said, um, my understanding well, is so that, Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. So I should probably talk about actually then what happens to you as a person going through that eight weeks. Uh, so basically what happens is they want to make sure you're a good fit uh, for this because eight weeks of doing therapy and it's pretty intensive is, it is a little bit of work, but it pays off. And so on the front end, um, you'll have an initial session and they'll get to know you. And um, so clinically and, and also just non-clinically, non what's happening for you? What, what really are the things that you're concerned about and you're struggling with? Um, and, and make sure that they you fit for um, able to. Um, so through that assessment, then they'll come up with a good plan for you. What's going to happen for you in those eight weeks? How is it going to be built out each week for you? And what happens in this type of therapy is called cognitive behavioral therapy. And I think you've probably, you know, you all have probably seen commercials where they've now used the word cognitive behavioral therapy, but it's really just good therapy. And what it does is every week with your therapist, you are learning new skills that help you pay attention to 
okay, what's happening with my thoughts? How is that affecting how I'm feeling and maybe how I'm reacting in life? And then gaining skills about how to um, better manage those thoughts and especially how those impact your just life and dealing with a pretty serious medical condition. So every week you learn new skills with your therapist. And so it's almost like a behavioral health boot camp, but they help you because in between sessions, you're going to be given exercises, you know, to build up your skills. So in between sessions, you're going to get a coach that's just going to be there to support you along during that week um, to make sure that you know, you're comfortable with the exercises there, you know, you feel confident, you're motivated and keep on moving. So if, if you can imagine, if you do that every week, you have a great session with your therapist, you learn a lot. Then in between sessions, you practice a lot, but you have a coach there to support you. So at the end of those eight weeks, when you graduate, you almost can't help coming out changed. Uh, so it's, it's a really good model, but not everybody, um, you know, needs that. Uh, some people just need to have a, uh, some short sessions with, you know, uh, maybe a, a therapist um, or some, you know, people that are really struggling with more complex um, conditions uh, probably shouldn't be in that type of model and, and be more in a, in a more intensive model. So we work with able to to make sure that we get the right people there. And then if they're not the right fit, then we help. Um, your folks get to the right um, behavioral health care. Excellent. And I can think of times in my own life where a program like able to would have been helpful to, to build those skills, whether it was birth of my first children, loss of a close loved one, or my own diagnosis with uh, of diabetes last year in the midst of the pandemic, um, just learning how to, to cope with that. And I want to encourage those listening who are uh, FSBP members to learn more. You can go to able to that's a B L E T O dot com slash enroll um, to learn more information or give us a call. Uh, one of our health benefits officers would be happy to tell you more. Um, Bill, I want to pivot a little bit because I, I mentioned before that able to is available only to our members who are located in the United States. It's not available to members overseas at this time, but we do have other support programs that are available to our members wherever they are in the world. Um, we've talked about some of those in an earlier episode and we'll have future episodes to, to dive into those but I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit more about the care management services that, that are available to FSBP members. Um, and we have a dedicated team of professionals there. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the, the team who, who's on the team and, and what training they have to, to support our members? And I love that team. I, you know, I've been with that now for almost 20 years uh, and in part of my life, I had the uh, privilege of being able to, you know, oversee and and uh, work with wonderful teams of behavioral health uh, clinicians that um, are you know, basically we have different types of clinicians, but we're all here to help you with is very important things. And for your team, and I know personally actually because I hired her, <laughs> uh, Dara Smith is the person that oversees the, the behavioral health. Um, a clinical team that's connected also to the, the medical team. So they really work hand in hand. And within that clinical team, they're licensed, you know, basically they are licensed behavioral health professionals at different levels. We talked about, um, you know, the different levels of uh, behavioral health clinicians. And so primarily these are folks that have their licensed clinical social workers, um, their licensed professional counsel counselors. Uh, that's, the, that's the majority of them but they also have support with uh, psychologists and also our medical directors as well to, to work as a team. The, the most important part about this team is regardless of whatever is happening for you, if you have a need for help related to in, any behavioral health issue, they're there for you. Uh, we, we don't care about you know, having to you know, meet a certain kind of category or qualification. Our job is if you have a behavioral health need, let's just say it's I'm struggling to find a provider or I don't know where to go. Um, I'm feeling depressed. Do I see a psychiatrist or do I need a therapist or do we need both or do I just need to do yoga? Um, you know, our job is to help understand what's going on for you and then get you connected to the right care and, and services. And so that's what this team does. And, that, that is not utilized enough. 
Uh, we spend a lot of time helping families and members with highly complex behavioral health issues, and that's great, but we're concerned about those people we don't know about that are struggling, and we want to be open and, and available for those folks. So, Bill, just to, to be clear, the, the clinical team, they're not directing care. They're, they're connecting people with resources, maybe letting them know um, the providers in their area and giving them the choice to, to seek out that care. You, you touched before, and I, I want to talk about the, the full broad range of support that's available. You mentioned before increasing numbers of autism diagnoses year over year. Is there support within this team to help either people who are, who are themselves managing their own autism or helping manage autism for a, a family member and, and helping that person grow and learn um, in their own way? Absolutely. Uh, so when you think about the journey for parents, uh, as they um, this discover uh, that their children is, is suffering for, for you know from some form of autism spectrum disorder, uh, you know just the um, that experience alone, uh, in, you know just coming around the parents and making sure that we can bri- provide them all the support that's needed during that time, uh, just on the on the on the front end. And so what that means is that uh, you know helping that parent one get to the right. Uh, providers that can do the, um, you know, provide the right diagnosis. So that's the first thing. So on that front end, we are here to help um, get you to the providers that are expert uh, with making that assessment. So from that point then is we are along that journey uh, as long as the parents need us. And so that means if the, there is a confirmed diagnosis of autism, then the next step is, okay, what needs to happen for this child in terms of getting that child into the right treatment? And it's not just treating the, uh, you know, the, the, the disorder in, it, you know, in itself in terms of the behavioral health parts of the treatment. A lot of these children also might be struggling with medical conditions. And so our team is going to get uh, that child and help the parents get to the right behavioral health treatment. And I'll talk about that in a minute, but also make sure that we're connecting with the medical team and, and working as a team if there are any ongoing medical issues. So that's, that's important. A lot of times these children are going to need to use both sides of the benefit, the behavioral health benefit for a specific type of treatment called applied behavioral analysis. But then there's also other things like occupational therapy, speech therapy, um, maybe even physical therapy. So those, that comes from the medical benefits. So we need to be working together um, and take as much of the homework away from that parent to get things lined up. Uh, so that's why it's important to have an integrated piece. So for the point though, um, you know, our job is to be that navigator and, and advocate for the parent as they're trying to figure out, well, how do I use a benefit? How do I get my child um, assessed and diagnosed and how do I get them into the right treatment? That's our job. Uh, and, and so one of the most effective types of treatment uh, for children with, with autism, especially early on, is applied behavioral analysis. So very intensive treatment. Um, you know, it happens almost daily uh, for many, many hours during the day, depending on the, the needs for the child and the, you know, the, the, the capacity for that child to to be in that type of treatment, but we're talking hours a day. So our job is one to get you, I uh, get the parents um, connected to a provider that does very good applied behavior analysis. And then from that point, several things have to happen. Um, the, um, the child has to go through a pretty intensive, what we call functional um, assessment to deeply understand what are the behaviors um, that are actually, you know, problematic, but what are the behaviors we want to bring out and reinforce and build and create a good treatment plan around that. And so we work with the providers to make sure that that's all in place and that it's working. So we, we connect with those providers along that, along the way. So that's on the, that's how we oversee just for the parents that the treatment's working, but we're also concerned about just what's happening for the parents uh, and also more broadly, there's a lot of caregivers typically involved within the family that you know, are gonna be there as part of this. And so we wanna make sure we get the parents ready for when this child um, um, starts getting into the school system and how you navigate the school, the school system because they're gonna be responsible for also um, providing um, you know, treatment to support that child in terms of being able to learn 
within the school environment. So we work with the parents to make sure that that all happens. And we also um, help the parents understand what's happening just for them and their caregivers, very stressed out caregivers. Uh, they also need to pay attention to their mental well-being. And so we're making sure that we're assessing about how they're doing. And if they need that help, um, if they actually have a, um, um, availability for like able to, able to has some great programs for people that are caregivers, especially around autism. And so if that's appropriate, we'll get them to able to or any other supports to help them manage stress and, and, and all the things that they encounter. Excellent. Well, I, I just want to mention for our members that if, if you'd like to access um, or to speak with a care manager, please call 1-800-593-2354. And um, Dr. Gillis, I'm, I'm afraid that's all that we actually have time for today. So I want to thank you for joining us, um, sharing your expertise. I hope that we can have you back sometime in the future to discuss another topic um, or another element of care and support available to FSBP members. So thank you again. For more details, I encourage you to check out the FSBP brochure, sections 5E and 5H, teledoc.com slash enroll, or to make contact with a care manager um, with our clinical team call 1-800-593-2354. You can always contact the plan at 202-833-4910. We'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Ask the Talks, a production of the American Foreign Service Protective Association. Please subscribe, rate, and review the show and tell your friends about it. We welcome your feedback on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Look for at Ask the Cares. All information offered in this podcast is meant to be educational. Comments offered by the hosts or guests are not intended as medical advice. Please direct questions about your personal health needs to a provider. Should there be any discrepancy between information offered in this podcast and official plan documents for the Foreign Service Benefit Plan or other products offered by ASPA, the policy provisions will prevail. Special thanks as always to Hannah Wolfhart for producing, editing, and mixing this episode. We'll see you next time.